Great to see you all again. Fantastic, uh, hot, dry day in uh, in Brussels. Um, today, I, I'm I'm really quite excited about this uh, this topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, it's a highly topical topic. We've we've talked about it before in the O Cafe, but the topic is artificial intelligence. Um, previously, we discussed it alongside the projects AI for Copernicus and AI for EO, both of which have um, been um, established as a means to help companies improve their data analytical capability. But today, um, I wish to take a different perspective on the topic, which I'll return to in a moment. And firstly, just a reminder, um, EO Cafe, you know, we're here, we like to sort of see you, we like to you know, people to meet. Um, but please, if you want to keep your, your camera on, Perfectly, we're happy that you do so, but um, please keep your microphone off unless I specifically ask you to, to join the, uh, the conversation. If you have any questions, put them into the chat so that we can see them coming up and in a certain sense prepare, but uh, it will allow me to, uh, to call upon you to ask your question um, if, we, uh, if, we, if we come to it. So let's say, just to say that due to various things happening around me, I've not got the classical, I'm not in the classical EO cafe, I've moved locations uh, for, for this one. Um, but hopefully that will only be temporary, but uh, we'll be back to normal uh, next time. So today, I'm very pleased to say we have two uh, distinguished guests from the European Commission Joint Research Centre, Blagoj Delipetrov and Hire Hradesh. Um, when I was looking for experts to discuss this subject, I thought of the JRC very much as we want to talk about issues linked to policy. And the JRC is the research centre for the European Commission in terms of policy and advising on technical uh, technology impacts on, uh, on, uh, on policy. So uh, it seemed highly appropriate. So I turned to my uh, good friend, Peter Van Ness, who's, who's with us. Um, who helped me to find Blagoj and Huri. So uh, before diving into the subject, let me um, just ask them both to introduce themselves, just to explain their own background and specific interests. So um, who do we start with? Blagoj, you're, you're at the front of my screen, so I turn to you first. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, so my name is Blavoj Dilipetrev and I work uh, in GRC for the last five and a half years as project officer, mostly dealing with AI and machine learning technologies. Since the joining in GRC, I was working on that. I have a PhD in artificial intelligence and in the, let's say the latest uh, wave, I'm very into large language models and chat GPT technologies. And this is what I will talk about on this call. Thank you. Right, thanks, Blago. Here. Okay, thank you, Dirabet. And uh, I worked in GRC for 10 years on uh, data and AI in practical terms. Uh, we worked with Blago in the same unit, and uh, we are very good friends, which means that we argue very often. And uh, I, I love his perspective on things. Well, before joining commission, uh, I, I was running national analytical agency for a decade and uh, worked in public administration for a very long time. Uh, the, the most interesting thing is seeing the complete development going uh, from uh, super simple language models at a level of statistical mining through uh, let's say shallow neural networks to the very deep neural networks that we are experiencing today. And uh, I'm very glad and uh, honored to be invited. So uh, I hope I will, I will be able to provide together with Blagoy good I'm, information. I'm, I'm sure of that, Hiri. And uh, I, think, uh, I think we'll have an interesting uh, discussion. I, I expect a lot of interaction with the audience as we, uh, as we move on as well. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we've looked at AI in the past through the two projects I mentioned, um, but that was both, both through the lens of how AI can help extract information from large or even huge, rich and multi-dimensional data sets. And it seems a perfect technology fit for Earth observation and the images that uh, the satellites are, are gathering and trying to, uh, uh, to help 
analyze those. Um, the two projects, uh, AI for Copernicus, which is led by Democritus, I know more about. I've been working a little bit with them. Um, but also the AI for EO project, I think, have done quite a lot to help um, provide the tools by which companies can perform these data analytical tasks in a more efficient way. But in the last few months, we've seen the emergence of, of a different set of AI tools based around large language models. And these have ha having a sort of a massive impact in the, in the press and in, in society generally. And we see a number of ways in which they can impact on the community, the companies, particularly of Earth observation, but probably more broadly as well. And so that's what we wanted to uh, talk about today. So whereas um, this familiarity with uh, with artificial intelligence, the application of it, I think, is is different. And um, we, we, they use like real language as input, both input and output, and hence are causing great consternation and great analysis in academic circles for students to write their reports and theses. And uh, of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and business, well, government and business have been watching. Business has become heavily involved. We've seen a lot of calls from uh, from big companies. We've seen a lot of new companies coming in, promoting technology. Um, and it's a very confusing picture. Um, we're seeing a lot of calls for what appears to be quite heavy government regulation. And when you see the IT giants calling for regulation of their own sector, we have to sit up and watch. But at the same time, what, what's going on? We'll return to that subject in a bit later. So to my very limited understanding, um, the underlying technology used in the data, data analytics and the large language models tools are essentially the same but the models on which they're working are different. And that's what we're, we're really um, uh, starting to see. And so my first question to, uh, to uh, direct to, uh, to hear a first as Black Eye started last time, um, how different are the large language model tools or GPT, generative pre-trained transformers, compared to those being used for data analysis? Hear it. Um, well, I, I guess there's a big gap yet between open source models that we can all download from the internet and use directly. Their capabilities are increasing pretty fast, yet uh, what we don't see is uh, what are the real models trained by the big companies. What mm -hmm. we are getting access to through API are tamed beasts. You know, uh, there's a thing called constitutional AI through which we tend to control the, the large uh, language models nowadays. And uh, so, so we don't actually know what's going on inside big companies. Mm. And uh, when, when it comes to day-to-day -day analytics, uh, it's, you know, you know, it's beautiful. Super quick example, um, I was asked by my colleagues to mine information on who's doing what in multiverse. It took me like three hours to do the statistical mining of all the companies. And then I got stuck with uh, unsorted heap of uh, different words from statistical mining. Then I employed uh, GPT-3 saying, mm -hmm. look, uh, what are the companies doing? And I instantly got answered that, that was so beautiful, so nice, so generalized and so flexible that I was able to deliver top-notch analytics super fast. Yeah. Yet, this is the tamed version. There, many things are not allowed. Yeah. So what's going on in the background? Exactly. Like, I would switch, what's your perspective? Um, um... I, I, I completely agree with Irji on this. And um, uh, I must admit, uh, since December, we are opening a new page on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, before December, we had uh, perfect data analytic tools, automatic data analytic tools. They, you, you put them data, they, they give you a perfect report, output, etc. But I think this in December, we need to talk about intelligence. And uh, I'm serious Then we think about uh, uh, a spark of uh, real intelligence. And there is even a very nice paper of Microsoft that first tested this technology, GPT-4, before releasing it. And they have a, a huge report of real uh, possible artificial intelligence. You know, until now, we had tools that help us uh, to be more productive. But I think now we are one step and I mean, really a big step uh, forward mm -hmm. in, in this field. So what I want to say is that uh, now we have tools that in a way can reason, can plan, uh, so they can uh, uh, connect in a conversation. Before ChatGPT, there were a lot of uh, large language models, uh, even from the big tech uh, uh, or that were accessible, but truth be told, they didn't work. Even Google have put a couple of them on, 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 the, on the stage. But with uh, ChatGPT, we got a real conversational edge that follows the, the, the length of the conversation, that understands what you want to ask and gives you the right information and uh, take into account that it, uh, it really has the whole information probably of the entire text of the internet. So it's a really smart uh, artificial intelligence uh, tool and system. And it really can help in zillions of domains i mean uh from from generating code to improving your writing to to whatever you would really like uh, it's really capable even uh, give you advices of uh, some medical advices i mean I, I even use it sometimes for this you know what to do if i have a back pain etc so it's really a very general tool uh, and what Irji said, it's also uh, very valid. Uh, we, we, we know what is on, in the open source arena, which is uh, definitely catching up. But the big players like uh, Google, OpenAI, they are really having the big models and the giants that uh, are serving uh, many customers. And I think they have uh, bigger capabilities than the, the models that we are having, let's say, you know, in, in, in open source arena. So, yeah, I think this is the, the major difference that started since December. And I think it's some kind, uh, I'm going to mention this couple of time, uh, an, an iPhone moment for AI. Uh, why an iPhone moment? Because, you know, it's the very similar. I think everybody had a mobile phone, but when the iPhone uh, started with the touch screen, it changed the whole industry. And I think this is the moment for, for AI. At, uh, we are at the moment of AI, iPhone moment for AI. I think based on our discussion just before the call, uh, it, you also likened it to the fire moment. So uh, perhaps we, we, we come back to that when you explain that sort of ambiguous, uh, slightly uh, esoteric comment. Um, I mentioned about, uh, you mentioned about you know, what's going on behind, what, what we don't know. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's something that frightens a lot of people. Um, and I mentioned about the the calls for regulation, and that uh, you know, if if an industry itself is calling for regulation, we have to look and see what what's what's going on. Um, many say that this is simply to protect commercial positions rather than to um, open up uh, sort of controls on the technology. What was your perspective? How much is it about? controls on the use, the application, the development of the technology, um, and how much is it about uh, you know, really competitive issues? Any any views on that, Lago? Um, I think this is the hot topic of the day, I think, in the okay. last couple of months. It is uh, very prominent. I think it's a combination of many things. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe some of the big players want to, uh, and there was a big, uh, let's say, outclash, especially on Twitter, when uh, some of the big players wanted to, to, to regulate AI and give licenses. They say, okay, if you give licenses to 10 companies, what the rest are going to do, you know? What are we going to do? So I think it's a very valid question. So uh, I, it's definitely, I think the regulation should not go, uh, go uh, in the direction of stifling competition and giving uh, licenses to a couple of players. I think that would be very bad mm -hmm. because that will concentrate the power really in a couple of companies, which I don't think it's, it's intention even for, for, any, for any country, even USA. So um, I think there is a valid argument for that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 
if the big players ask for regulation, then probably it's, it's needed. I mean, but we have to also understand that we are talking about a, a thing that happened in December. So it's, uh, you know, regulation don't happen overnight. I mean, oh. and uh, we need time. And uh, I think there is definitely need for regulation. And I think uh, regulation in combination with the big tech, but also open source community and all the stakeholders, not big tech only because I think their interest, they will protect, of course, their interest. It's completely normal. But with a larger stakeholders community of uh, really discussing the main issues and challenges, I think uh, regulation, even I think I, I read yes, uh, today even posted uh, our uh, vice uh, president is uh, there will be some kind of code of conduct, uh, like voluntary, uh, which will which will be drafted very soon by uh, uh, by European Union and in the United States, which I think is very useful. Because this is like now the wild, wild west, I think some basic rules should be set uh, to, to, to make it right. Uh, today, um, China are calling for, uh, for stronger controls as well. So uh, yet, yet another uh, development. But uh, are things happening quick enough? I mean, can it, can it keep up with the uh, technology? Because things are happening so fast. As you say, it was only November that uh, ChatGPT suddenly became uh, publicly usable everyone's piled into it. I mean, in, in six months time, the impact is uh, is enormous. True, true. Now that, that's a fact. I mean, uh, we are probably even now coming from the European Commission, we should also in, in increase uh, faster, making faster policy. I mean, that that is, a, 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 we have to do that. Just, uh, just a highlight, uh, uh, OpenAI chat GPT uh, got 100 million users in matters of weeks. Uh, compared to any kind of previous uh, uh, application took years, a couple of years, like Instagram and, and Netflix. So yeah. this really is propagated in a couple of weeks. So uh, if, you know, you, you have to be fast if the technology is fast. So, yeah. I mean, that's it. Yeah. Jerry, do you have anything to add on that? I'm thinking about the loop analogy and uh, in 1945, out of the team who was working on nuclear bomb, quite a number of people actually switched the site and started doing a com for complete control of nuclear weapons, simply because they knew. Not the politicians, not the general audience, not, not the peacemakers, peacekeepers, whoever, but those who were in, in these planos laboratories. Um, the key problem that I personally see is uh, emergence of capabilities. Uh, as every complex system, well, someone gives me data, they see rows and columns, I tend to see an object, you know, it can be a brick, it can be wrap, it can be worn, it can be blue, doesn't matter. But we don't see enough. We don't see enough of uh, the data with our simple senses. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, from the neural network is able with extreme increases in complexity, finding these patterns, what would we now feel like almost human when we talk to ChatGPT or any in big instruct model and we are getting back something that looks like human. This is one of the emerging capabilities. Yeah. We don't know what we are going to get with the new increased complexity. Like when, when yesterday uh, NVIDIA has announced a completely new hardware, which is out of scale because it's coming with the technical capabilities are coming these new models. They were, un we were unable to train them a couple of years back. There was no hardware capability. Mm. You know, so, so the thing is constant emergence of something. We have absolutely no idea what it will be. Are we going to regulate it? Well, we should. Uh, are we going to be capable of regulating it without AI hardly? So it would be a proxy regulation, I guess. How are we going to set up firemen to control the fire? 
instead of uh, controlling the fire directly. Mm. Mm. I mean, what, one one of the issues that's that's coming out is 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 the quality of the output. You know, you get a a response which appears to come from a human intelligent uh, um, person. Um, and how do you tell if that is true? We had one of the, I remember companies recently put a technical question into chat GPT um, to produce a, a, an earth observation product, uh, an NDVI of a, an area of uh, fields, very classical. Um, but he asked it to generate the code and he came up with 50 lines of code and he tested the code and he said, yeah, the result was was, was good. He's an expert. He knows the result is good. Um, the non-expert can do the same thing, can ask the same thing. But how does he know whether it's it's good or bad? How do we control quality? This is a, a very broad question, of course, but uh, I'd be interested to have your views on that. How because you know, we're talking about companies to our business you know, how how do they exist if um it's if if uh, uh there are, what am i trying to say that there is false information you know how do you distinguish how do you control the quality of what comes out well um, i would say I read in March that uh, this month is going to change uh, mankind and economics for a big game. Yeah. Um, th there's a massive democratization process uh, where how it's becoming easy, what stays as the key question. So having someone who understands the output who can ask the correct question and check that the output makes sense and it's relevant to the output will be more and more important. And uh, I, I think there is a danger of a, let, let's say, decoupling between uh, the senior experts who know, who know why, who know what, and can check on the output and compare and imagine those who don't have this experience who don't know how. And it's like Wikipedia. You, by reading Wikipedia, you are not becoming an expert. This is super powerful Wikipedia and Stack Overflow and all the literature in the world. Yet the quality is subjective. Yeah. So uh, that is it relevant to your problem or not? Is it applicable? Is there a mistake? Is the code producing something nonsensical? So, yeah, yeah, you know, there are questions. And not only that, uh, for eternity, there was always, uh, let, let's say, framework how to test every single thing from remote sensing to language models to anything. With these language models, we are now in the situation when we don't have any. We only have qualitative, subjective, because those models have consumed the whole internet. And how are you going to test the whole knowledge of the mankind? So, so, so what we are now at a level of, a, is it going to reply to all the questions for entering a university, a wall university? Okay, yeah. But it doesn't say anything about the medical field. It doesn't say anything about programming, but the model is capable of them all. So again, th 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 there are so many issues with this new emerging technology. That's uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is fantastic. It's, it, it's on the, also uh, slightly frightening. Um, you mentioned Stack Overflow. Um, haven't they had a big problem of um, of uh, sort of artificial answers being fed in to uh, uh, to their database, which has sort of invalidated the uh, the the whole process that it's going through. Blago, you're nodding. Yeah, yes, uh, I think Stack Overflow uh, banned use of uh, bots because they, they found out that many people are posting uh, generated content from chat GPT and, you know, improving their ratings on, on, yeah. on uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, but for the, for the previous question, I want to add uh, first, uh, this is not like uh, now it's fixed. So this is improving. 
Uh, yesterday, uh, OpenAI published uh, um, uh, a paper in a new uh, technique to improve machine uh, um, tests, uh, not machine tests, but uh, uh, maths, solving maths problems. So if it's uh, chat GPT-4 solved them like 70%, now it's solving them 80% because instead of just uh, checking out is the final answer correct, now yeah. they're checking the whole pipeline of answers are they correct. So they're improving, you know, where it makes mistakes. So the, what we have a version, this is version one, it's 3.5, but it, 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 for us it's version one. Uh, so uh, the next version is going to be better. The next version is going to be even more better. Take into account that uh, we, as we are using it a lot, we also indirectly are improving the model because, you know, if I'm uh, having like five sub question to a question, probably didn't give me the right answer. Yeah. And if I'm very happy, I, I made another question. So even if we don't know this, the, 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 the people in OpenAI know this, how to use these uh, uh, systems in reinforcement learning to, to improve their model. So this is just going to go up. Uh, so we are going to get better uh, answers in, in coding. We are going to get better answers in, in many other things. And I shared with you, uh, I was testing because I wanted to improve my personal web page. I had old one very a long time ago. So I said, now it's the perfect time to, to try ChatGPT4 uh, to give me a code for my personal web page. And seriously, it, uh, it I, I made it in a couple of hours. It will definitely take a couple of days. Um, I'm not saying five days, but one, two days. But I made it very fast because I knew what I wanted and it spit out the code in Python and, and Bootstrap very fast. So. Uh, it's a super co-pilot. That is the most important message. So uh, people should use it as a co-pilot, not as an uh, ultimate truth, because the ultimate truth, it's a different discussion, very long one. But uh, okay. a great co-pilot, you know what you want to get, uh, try to answer it, and it's going to guide you or help you get to the answer. But to get, again, this comes back down to who, who's who's asking the questions, who's using it, and uh, exactly. what what their motives are for for using it, and uh, how do you get behind to understand if their motives are, are good or or bad? Exactly. Okay, um, there's a question come up on this. It's slightly different to the way I'm uh, wanting to approach it, but one issue I can see is IPR. Um, so chat GPT produces some code, produces some written material, um, which is drawing from other sources. I mean, it, it's I'm always impressed the way it cites the sources that it's it's using, which is extremely uh, helpful if you're producing a report. Um, but if there is IPR associated with the output, um, how does that how do companies react to that? Because that could be in breach of their IPR or they could be breaching other IPR issues. Is, is that something which is being uh, looked at and the, the issue, the legal responsibility for the, for the, for the output? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 this is beyond hot topic. The, the, this is really, uh, Plasma hot topic. Um, for instance, I think it was Samsung and many other big companies who just said uh, no programmer can use ChatGPT for uh, the code development, not because uh, it is not empowering, but because it is uh, it was trained on publicly available code, and we don't know if. It, it is not just a statistical parrot who just spills out what it has learned. Mm. Because the biggest fear of these companies is uh, if I have 100,000 patents on my code, uh, the, the, you know, the, the patent lawyers, litigations in this domain are something normal lawyers never heard of. Yeah. But the level of complexity is extreme. Now, Imagine that someone came with icebreaker into this thin eye. <laughs> and what? So, so, so the key problem is we don't know what exactly is the model generating. Is it something that is one to one to some code somewhere? And who's the owner? Well, 
uh, the uh, so, some few months ago, I, I, it started what's called uh, token scarcity. Mankind so far has not produced enough text throughout its all history to feed the large language models. And uh, so, so anything w w which was ever written, printed, has already been fed into these models. The thing is, um, a lot of data, and you can see it especially in, in trained uh, image models, have been just collected without questions asked. It's like um, the, the common crawl, the, a huge fantastic activity which makes a copy of internet every month and put it on, on the Amazon to, to be available to anyone. Yet, there's so much licensed content, nobody knows how, if, and in what sense was introduced into, into corpora the models were trained on. And there's no way to find out. <laughs> you know, so, so lawyers are super happy because uh, th this is going to be a fantastic source of income for years. One, one area where employment will increase. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can count on the lawyers. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start opening up the questions because we've got one which is uh, is very closely linked linked to that. Um, uh, Spiridula Karid. Garida um, is asking about uh, sort of the legal basis for the data. Sperida, do you want to come in and um, put your question? Or do we take it from the chat? Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, first, I was wondering if, uh, as we speak, um, that uh, GPT, GPT uh, uses, actually uses Earth observation data. If, if it has the capability of uh, use uh, Earth observation data. Uh, the next question is, uh, is, it a, is that legal? <laughs> and uh, under uh, which legal basis, according to the GDPR, this new uh, artificial intelligence tool, because I would like to, to call it like that, because it, today it's a chat GDPT, tomorrow perhaps it's uh, something uh, different, am I correct? Uh, which exactly legal basis uses to use under in view of GDPR to use earth observation data? Is it allowed according to GDPR? That's, uh, that's my question. Because as, as we are, Copernicus opened data policy for me is an issue. Now with uh, this new artificial intelligence, the situation becomes even, even more complex and dangerous, I think in view of privacy in general and data protection. This is my question. <laughs> Thank you. Please I, respond. I, I don't know the exact answer. Uh, I think it's well, well, it I, I would most say GPT-4 is multimodal model, meaning uh, it is able to consume both text and image. That's my understanding. First. Second, the paper on GPT-4 has not yet been published. So we have zero idea what it was trained on, how it was trained, uh, uh, on what data, how many uh, APRs they broke, uh, who's going to get upset once they start reading the paper someday in the future, and so on and so on. So th the answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, <laughs> The, one of the reasons for the regulations. Second, um, uh, what is even more interesting is, and I think we'll be talking about it more uh, in the upcoming uh, minutes, um, is data fusion. Um, and I mean real end-to-end -end data fusion, where the language model is just a tiny, unimportant uh, I would add, uh, excuse me, I would add crowdsourcing. I would add and crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing <laughs> as it is in Earth observation data is yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Uh, now with uh, this new artificial intelligence tool, I think uh, the, the situation is uh, very hard. Yeah. We can't control it. 
there is no control. I, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. The, the, the whole point is that uh, for the big giants, uh, I think they are trained on the entire entire what is on the internet. By by I mean entire, I mean really entire. So I'm not talking about whatever data it's on the internet. It's trained on. I don't think they they limit themselves somewhere. So and therefore they don't publish their data sets. So for the, the most of the commercial models, we don't know the data sets. I think they are not even written where they are. So we don't know. Uh, and they have these the gigantic neural networks, which are untouchable for any of us to even understand. You know, it's another level. It takes 10 million just to, to, to run the experiment. So it's a, it's a different, it's a different uh, play, play field. But uh, on the other hand, open source it's concerned about the, the legal rights of the data, and it's some, and therefore it's one step behind. In, in truth be told, because they're using less data. <laughs> Plus, the models are usually smaller, and uh, yeah, but they don't. I mean, not not uh, not. I'm not going to now name, but not even one of the big players has uh, set uh, their their data source, except from 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 the ones that they publish open source models and data, and. Uh, what is uh, uh, important to I think with uh, with Irji, she just mentioned, uh, I I heard the talk very recently. Uh, you know, uh, we have enough data. So if the te data text data is uh, completely used, we have a lot of uh, image data on the internet. Uh, what about video, YouTube? I mean, we have enormous amount of data that these models in the next versions will ingest. So they will ingest all the YouTube, they will ingest all the images, and I don't know what else, truth be told. Uh, but the truth is that we are going to have these multimodal uh, models that are going to ingest all kinds of possible data and produce answer. And they're going to be, of course, even one step uh, more useful and powerful and impactful to, 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 the, to everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you so, so much. So um, the question then comes back down to how can you how can you manage this? And uh, Volkhard Volkhard Gela um, is 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 asking you know, how can we control it? Volkhard. Yeah, uh, my <clears throat> sorry, my question, my issue is uh, with uh, patented algorithms, and I mean we know that mm -hmm. the algorithms can be patented in every country, but. Uh, what about the methodologies that are, uh, that are covered uh, by patents and protect, protected by patents, but published, of course, once a patent has been granted? Uh, if, uh, for instance, ChatGPT um, uh, has access, or any any uh, any large uh, language model or ML has access to these patents, and then, as you, as you just explained, uh, start to write write code uh, upon a request. Uh, I mean, how is the patent holder? How can the patent holder ever be sure that his IP is protected and that he has rightful access to licenses? Or is this all got going to kind of vanish into the uh, thin air of uh, the internet and then uh, somewhere put out uh, as, as a new code without notifying uh, by, by machine learning? Sorry about my language. I have a little bit of, uh, sorry about my voice. Sorry. <laughs> I have a little bit of a voice problem today. I'm both hard. Oh, yeah. no, 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 you're completely right. Um, here, nevertheless, uh, applies the basic uh, rule of uh, law, which says you are obliged to check that you are not breaking the law. So just because you have used a wonderful tool, automated instead of patent researcher, uh, it doesn't take responsibility. Yeah, you know the responsibility stays with you. Mm -hmm. So it, it's nice and it's beautiful. It's super fast. You can ask additional questions. My, my father is eighty-two, and uh, he still thinks he's too young to stop writing patents. And uh, yeah, you know, and this technology is something he loves talking to, exploring. But then going to patent office means he has to prove that his idea is original. He used this thing only as a, as a let's say, echo board. Just, yeah. just. And I think this, mm, you better not. Yeah, yeah. yeah but Yuri, the problem I have with this is uh, twofold. Uh, for, uh, 
one time, no, sorry, for once, uh, how can uh, someone who uses a code that has been generated by ChatGPT for instance, how can he be sure that uh, he is not violating any patent rights, any any IP? Because uh, if the, the big giants who offer these tools don't even publish their data source and what, what their model is trained on, there's no way to really trace this back because it's, I mean, we all know machine learning is based on neural networks. It's like dog training. It's, it's almost impossible to trace back how yeah. this model has learned and yeah. where it's taking its information. Uh, and then the, the, the second uh, uh, problem I have with this is that maybe the big giants don't even care because if you are as a small company have a patent and relying on new exclusivity and you, you're up against a big giant uh, somewhere in, in, in northern Colorado uh, with, a, with a huge uh, law de uh, department uh, holding hundreds of lawyers, how do you win against them? I mean, you, you're yeah. basically opposed to them, you're at their mercy. No, I agree with you completely. That's the big problem. And the, the, let's say the, the key logic of European legislation is if you don't prove it is harmless, it must not enter the market. The yeah. American logic is uh, until you catch us red-handed that we are causing harm, it is allowed. But the large language models are trained in the American philosophy. Yes. So yep. they are shifting the responsibility from them, and you can read it in, 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 in the uh, rules of use, to you. Mm -hmm. And this is mm -hmm. why the, the companies like, it was Samsung and IBM perhaps, the, the, I, I mean quite the big power, software houses, have said no way any of our programmers can use these tools because we just don't know what yeah. patents yeah. are they going to bring. So back to the old ways, just write it by hand, full stop. By the way, they are not allowed even to use Stack Overflow. But I think I think it's it's a little bit different. I think in this case, it was because they copy pasted some of their codes and tried to improve it. And let's say uh, they revealed some of their secrets. Even in the commission, I mean, one week ago we received an email uh, not to use uh, for any uh, critical report Chat GPT. You know, you can improve it for your writing, but if you're copy pasting something which is <laughs> let alone top secret or something <laughs> important, I mean, you should not use it. It's very simple. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I think the 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 there are a couple of points. First, uh, the large language models, even if they reveal the data sets, which I think they won't, but let's say they reveal, the whole concept of this neural network is that uh, uh, they cannot easily reference to the point source that mm. they took the information. That's the that's the one of the biggest problems, and mm -hmm. it is like that, and we cannot fix that easily. I think nobody is doing it. So. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty complicated issue. And uh, of course, this discussion and other discussions are very useful just to clear out what is now, what is possible, what is not, and definitely put some border lines in between. Right, which makes regulating it even more difficult. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, we, we said just now that the um, ultimately it depends on the intentions of, of the users, uh, whether their intentions are, are good about leaving aside the control of the technology and how that can be uh, regulated or, or or not what the access to uh, to data is but it has uh, there was another article today or very recently about the potential for transformation in in the examples in Africa but in developing countries and the potential to sort of jump technology levels as we've seen happen so many times in the past and to to offer good and hugo de gruff is um is talking about or, or uh, referencing the positive aspects hugo do you want to just come in and join us for a moment hugo you still there Okay. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I was fighting with the uh, mute control. With Zoom. With Zoom. Yes. Uh, hello, Jeff. Hello, Jerry. Good to see you and many other old friends. 
No, uh, there was a lot of talk about regulation and risks, and uh, the last years of my career we were involved in the AI regulation and the risk-based approach. But so there, there's a lot of issues. But for many years we've been discussing or pushing towards open data, openness, transparency. And now that there is indeed a lot of open data and data available everywhere, we seem to be extremely concerned about the risks and the use of it and the traceability. And we had these discussions uh, also in the commission about the quality of the data that goes into the, uh, into the models. And this quality must be ensured and must be guaranteed and so on. But to my knowledge, that's not how our neural networks necessarily work. The data does not have to be of perfect quality as such. But that brings me to, to remote sensing. For many years, the, the physics uh, of, that are involved in remote sensing, whether it's active or passive or whatever, are extremely difficult to, uh, to extract actionable knowledge information about the objects on the ground that we are interested in, be it agriculture, be it ships, be it whatever. Now, of course, can we actually combine now this uh, the data that we get from remote sensing from the with the other sources of data that we get to open source uh, crop calendars books meteorological observations data and so on to actually increase the efficiency of generating this actionable knowledge for a given purpose on the ground thanks to this uh, enhanced computing capacity and model capacity that's my question what up do you see concrete benefits in short term for these types of applications, which are becoming increasingly important considering what's happening on climate change, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've mm -hmm. been working with remote sensing data since early 1990s. And um, but, so, so I, I sort of understand the question. The, the problem is that, uh, that there's limited information in the picture that can be can be taken as such. But from the context, it, the, the, the information can be, let, let's say, improved a lot. And I mean, it's a creation of uh, multimodal models. Imagine we have uh, information about uh, the swath board coming uh, over this uh, point at this time, and the news reported that uh, there was flooding in the area. And uh, by the way, that there was a decrease in economic activity. And uh, from our models, I, I will get our data all coming together at once. And I don't mean like a what algorithm I write with my soily hands, uh, which is super limited in capability. But what, what the large language models have taught us the most is that when trained together on text and code, it has improved both both coding and text generation capabilities because there's common structure, common patterns, common knowledge that just got encoded. And the more information we will be adding, remote sensing data included, the new capabilities will start emerging. And you know, it, Perhaps I wouldn't be able to detect a mine from something big or low resolution. Yet, these models may take more information together and assess and give us. I am speculating, of course. I have not seen such a model yet. Uh, I, I agree with Irji. And uh, just to follow up, uh, I also believe that uh, uh, do different domains will build their own chat GPT models and it makes sense. So chat GPT is general, but uh, if you're like say investment banking, you want a chat GPT for investment banking. So you want to discuss stocks, you want to discuss prices. Uh, I go to, 
Exactly. Yeah. This is happening. So it's just a matter of time when this something will happen in Earth observation, similar, in a similar way. Uh, second, I also agree. Uh, you can use now a lot of information from uh, different sources, combine them and make actionable, uh, you know, results. And then I think it was uh, possible even before ChatGPT to be told. So I think this data fusion from a couple of sources we, we did uh, one small research, uh, so it's bad that they didn't publish. So we combine um, satellite imagery with um, uh, in-situ data to produce better forecast for uh, uh, ground. I, I think it was uh, ground humidity. And it worked better than to use only uh, this, uh, this data and that data. Combining a couple of data sources, it will make more sense. I've seen examples of emergency systems like flooding that uh, can combine uh, if there is a big rain flow and it will uh, alert people on the phones that there is a possibility of, of uh, you know, uh, again, I think the, the we are getting to places where there will be endless opportunities and use cases with different data in different models. And uh, I think one of the steps that I think soon will happen, maybe one, two years, uh, specialized chat GPT for, for Earth observation in the domain for the people and for the policy makers and users. Maybe there's one thing very specific to add. Less than a month ago, uh, Meta, the, the Facebook mother company, have released a model called Segment Anything. I, I, I work with, with uh, image data as well, so, so I, I learned to love it because uh, you, you give it a picture and uh, it will semantically segment your image. Then of course came improvements, grounded and uh, and yeah, yeah, you know panoptic and all, all, all the variables. But about two weeks ago, I've seen the first uh, paper saying, "Look, we have retrained segment anything on remote sensing data, and out of the sudden, it is it is self-trained without any classes, just because you gave it so much data." It was able to extract all the classes on their own, just because it is a common pattern in data. So, so applications like this will be coming, and you know it, it, it's two weeks now. <laughs> so, what is going to happen over the summer? I don't know, but but so th these are the new emergent capabilities coming from both huge hardware and ever-increasing knowledge of uh, how to deal with it. We're, um, we're coming to the end of our, our time. I've got two questions that I wanted to ask, but one is very close to that that Helge Statler has asked in the, uh, in the chat about the, 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 the positive side. So let me um, ask Helge to to put her question and then I'll put a, a closing question. Helge. Yeah, I've, I've, I've not really a question. So actually, yeah, uh, I put my statement out there already. So I think in the whole discussion, really the positive side of this, uh, these tools, I consider it as a new tool in our toolbox uh, is way underestimated. So it's, to me, it's also not intelligence. The intelligence is, it's really bad luck of, of use of this kind of word. To me, it's kind of a brute force statistics. That would meet the thing a little bit better from my point of view. So yeah, we have networks involved there, which are trained, but it's kind of some advanced statistics. It's not really intelligence what we are speaking about because there is no real understanding in that and it can also not explain itself to why certain things are there so uh, what you get is you get generated content which kind of is based on the statistic that has learned the context of of things but uh, yeah it still has a positive side in uh, structuring data and classifying stuff and that's what we can use so you cannot really yeah, it depends on what kind of data you feed in that you get a certain result. 
And I, I have to have to also say, yeah, that's that's a real valid point that there will be definitely specialized models for for special areas, for financial, for environmental, for maybe also organizational problems uh, in companies. So I think that there will be specialized models for special domains, and those will be helpful tools. I mean, we had I don't know twenty years ago we had the discussion about expert systems. Mm -hmm. which also got trained a lot of domain knowledge to mm -hmm. yeah. to bring to bring up logical answers which are not contradicting themselves and kind of we automated this now that's how i see it <laughs> and yeah to me uh, the discussion especially uh, in countries like germany is uh, way too negative too much emphasizing the risk side not seeing really the positive side of a new tool and it has a lot of uh, similarity from my point of view to historic uh, developments of innovation. So yeah, we see something new and we fear the new because we do not know yet how it's used, what kind of potential is in there, where it could be used for, and what kind of side effect it has. I think you have to really uh, throw yourself completely on it, uh, try to experiment with it, get a real feeling for the technology, uh, and then you will also get an idea about what kind of risks are in there, where are the limits. And that's the important stuff, I would say, to also get an idea about how it can support Earth observation. Hmm. Okay, I'm I, gonna, I, uh, please. I want to, yeah, yeah the, thank you. Uh, I will start from the end because I, I, I for the negative sentiment, uh, I think it's super important. And uh, I'm I'm a very big. Uh, there was a Stanford AI report, AI index is published yearly, and it uh, got the sentiment for AI across many countries. And so uh, this picture I share with everyone, and I really uh, want to spread the word, and even to this community. Uh, all the Western world countries uh, acceptance, or let's say uh, the 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 sentiment for AI is negative. Uh, so we are 30, 40 percent approving, or uh, even in the USA, across Europe, it's somewhere uh, very similar. While on the other hand, uh, China and India are with 80 uh, percent in positive. So I mean, this is really a big gap. And uh, all the news are about uh, new regulations, stopping uh, risks. Of course, there is need for regulation. And of course, there are risks. Of course, but we have to also see the benefits. And I mean, this is crucial for 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 moving forward. Otherwise, uh, we invented the ship and we're going to miss the ship. That will be a huge catastrophe for, for the Western world, believe me, because this technology will be used any, everywhere. So it's not now a question, are we going to use it? How much is going to be applied? No, I think that discussion is over. This is used already everywhere. Everybody has it on the phone, on the computer. So we need to find a way how to regulate it better, how to discuss the, the problems. There, there are open problems, of course. But definitely the sentiment must change also through the media and through education. I also encourage everyone to, to, to use it because education is the key. I mean, people feel what they don't understand. It, it's mm -hmm. so simple. And uh, just a small comment on the statistics. Um, you have to check the, 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 the last version of GPT-4. And uh, there is a very nice YouTube video of a Microsoft the person who, who present this. And... Uh, he, in this uh, presentation, says uh, there are no more benchmarks. We don't have benchmark for GPT-4. There is nothing to benchmark it with. It, uh, it gives the correct answer. So it's, it's, it's a different type of tool. It's, it's really something that, and it's a version, a new version. And um, it's, not, it's not related that much to statistics. Although I think this the topic of statistics is, is, is over so when there's uh, talk about AI. It's a different type of uh, technology that uh, it will change. But I completely agree with everything else what you said. And I think we have to, uh, especially for the sentiment, I, uh, therefore I interrupted you and Joseph, because if we don't, uh, if we don't use the technology, if we people, we, we are scared, I think we are getting uh, shorthanded on the long, uh, medium and short, long term. I stop here. Maybe because we are running out of time, I will just say Sorry. one quick thing. Uh, in 1870s, uh, in 1870, uh, there was a Prussia-Austria war, which Austria lost badly. 
and cost uh, Czechs uh, a bit of land. Uh, the, the reason was that uh, the, the uh, Prussian army used uh, backloaded rifles, while the Austrian they insist that uh, must be front loaded, otherwise the soldiers will be using too much ammo. I, I really feel like this is the same moment. If we don't allow ourselves to use reasonably such a powerful tool, it will not be a war that we will be losing. It will be the style of life that we are going to lose. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to end there, but I just wanted to sort of bring us back to the beginning. Just get your views very quickly now on what the impact are for this sector, Earth observation sector. I think we've, we've jumped around, we've talked a lot of the points. And just a reminder to everybody else, because I see questions from Dietrich and from Jeff Smith that I think would be very interesting to take. You know, we still have a free, uh, free discussion after we sort of close this formal part. So if you want to stick around and, and join the discussion afterwards, that would be that would be great. But uh, Blago Jiri, um, just very quickly, what will be the key impacts on on, on for, for companies, for companies in the in the uh, in the in the sector? Um, I Yes, you please you do. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know this is one of the favorite topics uh, on on copy we had with Blagoj. Um, you know, I, I remember one book on management because I spent many, I wasted many years of my life in top management. Uh, one of the key books I learned about management of change started with a simple sentence: "You are not obliged to change." survival is not obligatory mm. so uh, we are now in the situation when uh, everything is going to change radically it's not about uh, i don't have enough experts no it's now about uh, i don't know how to ask mm. i don't have a well-defined use case so so uh, i i think there will be a big shift between uh, emergence of uh, new contestants who are able to use these technologies and those who were unable to change themselves fast enough. So I, I that's my honest view. And uh, now, now Blago will say something smart. So face the future and be ready to change. Yeah. Uh, I, I completely agree. You, you took my line, in fact, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I completely agree. I think uh, I, I started like that, I will finish like that. This is the iPhone moment. So we had phones, uh, they had keyboards, they had everything, they worked, we liked them, they were spreading. Now we have a new phone, which is complete touch screen. And it is the first. Everybody is going to make the, the, this model, everyone. I mean, without exception, not Microsoft, not Facebook, not Samsung. Everyone is going to make this kind of models for their domain, for their speciality. And it's a gold rush. And who, who made it first is going to get the market more or less. And I think this is the, this is the, the message also. Uh, and uh, for the Earth Observation, uh, I think definitely they should invest in, in first investigating and hiring people to, to start exploring how they can include this in their pipeline as soon as possible. Because after, after you know, you get uh, behind and it's difficult to catch up. So... Uh, other companies and i mean definitely the smaller usually have advantage i mean this is always the case in when there is a new revolution or technology uh, so uh, again i think this is the, the this is the moment if you follow the stock market nvidia has exploded uh, because now the, the the requirements for gpus is out of the roof even all the tech companies, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft was expected to go up, but even Google is going up, Facebook is going up, everybody is going up who is into AI and into generative AI from before. Open source is also booming, like uh, nothing like before also. It's really mm -hmm. booming. There are a lot of tools. There are a lot of people working on it. The, 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 the ecosystem is really amazing. So, I mean, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, there will be a lot of niches to, to, to you know, to focus and to, to explore. Uh, and this is the, the, the time to get on the bandwagon because the next iteration is going to be multimodal with all possible data sources. The next iteration, God knows what it's going to be. 
So if you don't get now on the on the train, you're going to be left behind, unfortunately, in, in, in the time. So it's, it's really the time to, to get on. And the train is moving quite fast already. Fast. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. OK, so, so thank you both very much for, for joining us. It's been a, a really interesting discussion. I, I didn't doubt it, but uh, I hope everybody uh, has has enjoyed this sort of reflection on the, the impact of the, of the technology. And hopefully uh, people are now more ready to go, uh, to get on the train and to uh, to take advantage of it. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. We were we, the next EO Cafe should be in two weeks time. Uh, we were trying to organize something during the um, Expandio. Uh, so that's uh, that will be a very specific e event if it happens. So the um, the next one for everybody to, to look out for, 29th of June, uh, we'll be talking with the, um, the the new the Spanish presidency who take over on the 1st of July about their intentions for space and Earth observation under their presidency and what we can expect to uh, what we need to look out for more. So that's uh, that's that. Um, I mentioned Expandio. There's still time to to register. You can join physically, you can join remotely. We'd really like you to join physically, of course. Uh, so it's great to have the, uh, the networking opportunities. Um, it's uh, two days, 13th, 14th of, of June in, uh, in Brussels. It coincides with our uh, awards ceremony uh, from, from us. So you see who, uh, who's getting the awards this year. Um, so hopefully see, uh, see a lot of you, let's see a lot of you there. And with that, I'll close the uh, formal part of this informal EO Cafe and open up the even informal part, which is not uh, recorded. And anybody who wishes to speak, just open up your microphone and, and join in. There we go.